Thank you, sir. Why is the computer messing up? Okay. All right, once again, good morning class. Um, today we are looking at lecture seven facilities. Yeah. We will look at facility location and then we'll also look at facility layout. So mm -hmm. it's within the it's within the mandate of operations to help top management decide where facilities are appropriate to be located. Now, if I say where facilities are appropriate to be located, what I mean is this. Now, let's say we are Ghana Commercial Bank and we intend to um, set up a branch. We've identified three places, Medina, Abokubi, Medina, Abokubi, and um, give me one of the areas around these two towns. Abokubi, say what you say. Medina, Abokubi, and where? Adenta. 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 Medina, Abokubi, and Adenta. Uh, we've collected some data, and we need to use that data to help us decide which of these three places would be more appropriate for us to cite our location, for us to cite. In fact, maybe as, as, as a bank, we are not prepared to set up um, branches in each of these three locations because they are so close. We just want one branch. Where exactly should we locate it? Okay. My Again, when it, hello. Again. If we pick an organization like Melcom, which I keep using as a good example, they are doing well because now, remember we've learned something about services, that services, it has to be closer to the people who need it to be able to make maximum sales. Services will have to be closer, unlike manufacturing, which can be set up in the interior and then goods are transported to locations where they are needed. For services, you need to be closer to the consumption areas. And this is the approach we tend to see Melcom following, unlike other competitors like uh, ShopRite, which keep to the shopping malls. So far, I've not found ShopRite in any community. Has anybody found anything like that? They are, mainly the, they are mainly in the malls, correct? Yes. So if you go to Accra Mall, there is ShopRite. If you go to the one on the West Hills, there is ShopRite. Where again can you find ShopRite? Junction Mall at Nungwa. Junction Mall at Nungwa, there is ShopRite. You see? And interestingly, we don't tend to find Melcom in the malls. Is there, has anybody found Melcom in any of the malls? Hello? Okay, so I assume that you agree with me that Melcom is not found in the malls. 
perhaps it's a way of trying to ensure that they keep their cost to, to the barest minimum, or they want to own the facilities, I mean, their own facilities. So Malcolm is rather spread out in the communities. Yeah? And they tend to look at communities where there are, I mean, a good number of middle-class people. So you go to uh, Achimota, there is Malcolm, you come to my area, uh, what is the name? Ablake. Ablake, there is Malcolm. You go to where else? And like we found out last week, uh, currently Malcolm has about 40, is it 49? 49 outlets throughout the, the country and they continue to spread out their wings. Now, coming back to the Malcolm example in relation to these facilities, a time will come when Malcolm will have to set up what we call distribution centers. Now, those distribution centers will receive the goods from the suppliers as well as the goods which are imported into the center and then distribute to uh, selected outlets. So we can have one distribution center at the south, supplying the outlets within the southern parts of Ghana. And then we can have another distribution center in say Kumasi, which will be distributing to um, the outlets in the northern parts of Ghana. You see, so if Malcolm decides that, okay, fine. Now with the numbers in the Northern part, we need a distribution center rather than seven, all those outlets from our distribution center in Ghana, uh, sorry, in Accra, they will decide which of the cities will be more appropriate and for them to locate that facility, that distribution center. And this will depend on some data that they have. So today we are look, going to look at uh, facility location techniques, facility location techniques. There are about three of them in this lecture that we, we intend to cover. So let's go. So the first question is, what is a facility? And a facility is a building, is an equipment, is a plan, is a process technology that operations depends on. We should understand that when we are taking facility decisions, they are critical because they can affect efficiency of workers. They can affect how much and how fast goods can be produced. So if we decide to put up a teachable facility, a very tiny facility, we can, we can, we can be sure how, how comfortable workers will feel within that facility and how easy goods can be produced, okay? Um, again, facility decisions would also affect how difficult it is to automate a system and how responsive a system can be to changes in product or service design, product mix or demand volume. So that decision to set up a facility is quite critical. Now, facility design has a great impact on both quality and productivity, hence profits of the company. And they must therefore be properly planned, located, and laid out. They must be properly planned, located, and laid out. The layout aspect will, be, will come as a second portion to this lecture. Location incentives. Usually this is a, a kind of government strategy to allow for the spread out of, uh, for the spread out of the establishment of firms within the inner communities. If you look at Ghana currently, most of our manufacturing firms are located in the cities, Accra, Tema, and in and around this greater Accra region. Go to the interior, and for some reason they are not there. 
for a long time, there used to be only one manufacturing company in, in Koforidia, Koforidia, the capital of the Eastern region. And who knows the name of that company? Oh, nobody comes from Kofodia in this class. Do you know intravenous? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Infusion. They produce infusion. Yes, intravenous infusion, Kofodia. And for a long time, they used to be the only company manufacturing those infusion products within the whole of West Africa. But now I understand some other companies have been set up. Interestingly, they could also not grow big. As much as they were, they've, they've remained the same size for a very long time. But I understand the reason why that company was set up in Kofoida was the fact that they were given some tax credits. So if you're setting up outside Accra or outside some defined areas, we are going to have some tax credits or tax holidays for some number of days or some number of years. This is a good strategy that government can use to push some manufacturing companies into the interior so that we reduce migration. Everybody wants to come to Accra. Everybody wants to come to Kumasi. Why? Because these are the places where there are jobs. So we are all moving to the big, these two big cities. And these two big cities are becoming chilled. We need to help to spread out these companies into, into relevant areas, into, into areas where there, is, there are resources that can accommodate them so that they can employ people in and around those areas and stop them from coming to the big cities. So tax holidays is good. Uh, there could also be relaxed government regulation. There could also be job training. There could also be infrastructure improvement. So government can say that, okay, if you are setting up within this particular region, we'll make sure that we will construct the road from where you are located to join any of our main roads. And it also helps in developing those local communities, you see. So tax and uh, location incentives are there to be used to uh, push. If you look at the MPP government, they say every district. I mean, it's a good way to make sure that our companies are not restricted to Accra Tema. One district, one factory. At least we are, we are making sure that every single district in Ghana would have a company. And that means, how many districts do we have, districts we have in Ghana? How many districts do we have in Ghana? 210. 210 districts. Yes, so if they are able to achieve this uh, objective. So for how many of these companies have been set up? Okay, so you don't know. Go and look at well, look for it. They, they say they are at various stages of completion, so we don't really know which All ones right. are. Yeah. Okay, but I'm I'm just trying to relate that idea to what we are learning here. That if they're able to pursue that agenda to the fullest, if they're able to achieve that that objective, you see, then these companies ordinarily, which were, would have been set up in and around the big cities like Kumasi and Kumasi and Accra, will now be spread out all through the the entire country. Every single district is going to have one, and even if each of them is employing like twenty people or thirty people, these thirty people would have come to Accra to look for a job or come to Kumasi to look for jobs. But now they'll be kept in those districts, see? So it's, it helps. Okay, so these are some of the location incentives, past credits, relaxed government regulations, uh, job training, infrastructure improvement and money. In fact, Ghana, the government can also say, just like the, the one district, one factory, government can say that, if you are setting up within this district, I am going to support you with this amount of money. 
and that can push people to go into the district to, to help. Okay. So what location analysis techniques? Location, can we, can we uh, apply to make that informed decision of saying that we are going to locate a factory, we are going to locate a plant at Adesu, Asasewa, Temale, Balgatanga, and the rest. First, we look at what we call the location, uh, location factor rating. Then we'll look at the, the center of gravity technique. Then we'll look at the low distance technique. Yes, come in. <laughs> Class, my, my honorable HOD is here. So let me, uh, kindly give me a few minutes. When he's gone, I'll, I'll talk to you. Is it? Location factor rating. So what is this location factor rating? It is a method for identifying and weighting important location factors. Now, what do we mean by this? It is just like, Leonie, uh, Leonie, Leonie, are you there? Class, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Yes, please, we can hear you. Can you hear you? F1, how many? F1. F1, how many? They are making the class boring for me. F1, how many? Quarting. Gifty. Gifty. Yes, sir. I'm here. I'm trying to unmute. But you are very far. You are, you are very far from your laptop, which means you are oh, doing no. something else. No, please. I'm here. I was trying to unmute. No, I'm not far from it. I'm right here, please. Okay, I hear. So it's a method, location factor rating is a method for identifying and weighting important location factors. What this means is that you look at the factors which are important to you as, as an organization in locating uh, the facility. So for example, you may consider road infrastructure as a key location factor. You may also identify uh, good energy supply as another factor. You may also identify an area where there is, there is that skill which you would need to work in the organization. Yeah? There is that skill. So if, if your company is about fishing, you can't go to Tamale and set up a fishing this thing there because you will not have people with that skill there. Your company will have to come to the coastal area or somewhere closer to the major river river bodies like the Volta River, where you have people who know how to swim and people who understand fishing. So you identify critical location factors. And remember that the factors you identify, they will all not have the same level of importance mm -hmm. to you. Some will have higher level of importance, others will have lower level of importance. That's what we mean by you, you identify those critical factors to your operations and then you put weight on them. So identify important location factors, you assign weight and the, the weight is assigned from zero to one. So one can have 0.3, another one can have 0.5, another one can have 0.1, another one can have 0.2. So you assign weights to these factors. And then you score them. You score the, the area. Apart from the way that you are assigned to it, you also score it. And the, in terms of scoring, we, it's the, the scoring is done between zero and 100. And it is based on attractiveness compared to the other locations. Yeah? We find the product of the weight and, and, and score, which means we multiply what you have here with what you have assigned here. Assuming, assuming that for a particular uh, factor, you assigned 0.5 as the weight. And then in terms of scoring, you scored it 
uh, let's say uh, 95. Then when you come here, find the product of the weight and score. You multiply the 95 by the 0.5. That's what we mean. Uh, don't worry, I'll show you an example in the next slide so you don't get confused. Then we find the sum for, the, the, for each location, the weighted scores. And then we look at look up for the location with the highest sum. And then we select that location as the best. So normally when we are using the location factor rating, we need to identify multiple locations. Yeah, we should be considering two or more locations. And then we weigh them in terms of the key location factors. And we see which of them will emerge as the highest. So let's take a look. Gifty, you are there. Please read this for us. Um, okay, so um, location factor rating. The Dynaco Manufacturing Company is going to build a new plant to manufacture ring bearing that is used in automobiles and trucks. The size selection team is evaluating three sides and they have scored the important factors for each as follows. They want to use these ratings to compare the locations. So we have the location factor um, that is labor pool and climate and the weight is 0 0.30. Site one is 80, site two is 65, site three is 90. Then we have proximity to suppliers, and the weight is 0 0.20. Site 1 is 100, site 2 is 91, and site 3 is 75. Um, weight, weight rate, sorry. Weight is 0 0.15. Site 1 is 60, site 2 is 95, site 3 is 72. Community environment. Weight is 0 0.15. Site 1 is 75. Side two is 80, side three is 80. Proximity to customers, weight is 0 0.10. Side one is 65, side two is 90, side three is 95. Gifty, let me teach you this. In mathematics, you don't say uh, the number after the, the decimal, uh, the decimal, we don't mention it as 10 or 20 or 15. Okay, 0 0.15. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Right. So take note from today, all of you. Yes, please. Mm. Okay, so um, shipping modes, um, weight is 0 0.05, site one is 85, site two is 92, site three is 65. Then air service, weight is 0 0.05, site one is 50, site two is 65, site three is 90. Okay, great. So let's say this is Ghana Commercial Bank looking to site a, a new facility at, uh, the first one is Adenta, uh, the second one is Abokobi, Adenta, Abokobi, and then the, the third site is Medina, Medina, Adenta, Abokobi, and Medina. Now, please take note, what, we brought this thing in one of the exams and students couldn't tell us what I'm going to show you now. The total weight should, when you sum it up, should be, you should get one. So 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.15, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 0.05. Whatever weight that you assign, even if the items here are 20 or 25, the weight you assign here, to add up to one, to add up to one. Once it goes beyond one, then there is something wrong. It's a mistake. So in one of the exams, what we did, we did was we took one of them out. Let's say this one, we took this one out and asked students to tell us what should be here. Interestingly, a lot of the students got it wrong. They got it wrong. And so let, if this were to be absent, missing, and you are asked to calculate this, all you, do, you need to do is to sum what you have here and subtract it from one. Whatever you get will be what is here. So those are the weights. And I've explained to you that this weight will be assigned to the factors 
uh, subjectively, depending on what the company thinks or the selection team thinks is important to them. And in this example, the selection team think that labor pool and climate is very important to them. So they assign a bigger weight of 0 0.30. And then next, proximity to suppliers. They want a place which is closer to suppliers. And that is also weighted 0 0.20. You see? Okay, so these are the weights. Now, the score. You have three sides. Yeah? You are comparing the three sides on the basis of the labor pool and climate. So, coming back to our example, commercial bank. Uh, I said this is where. Adenta. Madina. Oh, David, this is Adenta. Adenta, Abokobi, and Madina. Okay, sir. Uh -huh. Adenta, Abokobi, and Madina. So, then a commercial bank looks at Adenta and says, oh, Adenta, the labor pool, I mean, labor pool, um, okay, we can't give them 100, but we can give them 80. Remember, this scoring again is subjectively done on the basis of how the three, or the, the sites you are comparing. You are looking at how they compare. So let's give uh, this place, let's give them 80. Uh, Abokobi, Abokobi, you are getting into the interior, not too well developed. So you wouldn't have many of the, uh, the University of Ghana students residing there or wanting to come there. Uh, so the labor pool there is not too good. We give them 65. Remember that the maximum each site can score is 100, just like we have here. And then for Medina, we saw that Medina is good. Medina is close to Legon and uh, uh, people in and around East Legon and all that. So Medina, let's give them, let's give them uh, 90. Medina, Adenta, which one comes first? Medina, okay. Yes, Medina. Medina comes first, okay. Now we'll come to proximity to suppliers. For the kind of suppliers we we'll use in this organization, the site one, site one I said is where? Adenta? Yes, Adenta. All our suppliers are located in and around Adenta. So we give this site 100%. Abokobi, uh, yes, some of the suppliers are also there, even though we currently don't use them, some of them are there. So we we'll give them 91. Uh, Madi. Medina, oh, they are a bit too far from the suppliers. So let's give them uh, 75. So this is how you do to score them. Remember the scoring is done subjectively, just like the assignment of the weights. But even though you are scoring them subjectively, you must have some element of, of objectivity in it. So what if you are talking about say um, suppliers, how many suppliers should you, how many of your suppliers should you find with a location in order to give a site 100%? Let's say we have about 20 suppliers we deal with. And out of the 20, if we find all 20 there, it is okay, we are giving the, pay, the, the, the site 100%. So there is, you are doing, doing it subjectively, but let, demonstrate some element of objectivity. Let us know that you are working with some guidelines, some principles, no raw like that. So if the out of the 20, we find out that oh, only 15 of those suppliers are also close to the second site, then we can say that, okay, we can't give this place 100%, let's give them 91 or 90, and the same thing goes. So we score them, site one, these are the scores for the various factors we have identified. Site two, these are the, the various scores, okay? Now, the, for us to decide which location to select, what we do is that we multiply this. Uh, so you can create a column by the side here, by the side of each side. And you can write weighted score. You can write weighted score. So weighted score as a column here, another weighted score as a column here, another weighted score as a column here. 
then what you do is we multiply 80 by 0.3 and then we put, if you multiply 80 by 0.3, what do you get? Give to you, what do you get? Okay, thank you, 24, 24. So we write, we write it with the, under the weighted score column for site one. Okay, then let's go to two. Proximity to supplies, 100 times 0.2. That would be 20, eh? Yeah, 20. 20. Let's go to 60 times 0.15. Nine. 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 So do the do the weighted score for each side. Yeah. And you do same for side two and three. When you finish, you sum them, you sum the weighted score up. So you sum it up, sum this up, sum this up. Quickly do that for site one and let's see what you get with the summing. All of you should try your hands on it too. Are we done? Almost. Has anybody finished? Yeah. So with the first one, I'm done. Okay, what did you get for the first one? The first one is 77.5. 77.5.5. Who has done for yeah. the second one? Who has done it for the second one? Okay, one of you should do it for side two and another person should do it for side three. Let's get the totals. Under the column, side two weighted score, side three weighted score, yeah? So side three, with a score be 82.05. 83. 82.05. 82.05. Okay. Yes, sir. What about, what about side two? Say 80.80. 80.80. Okay, so from the three scores, um, you are the operations manager. Which of the three locations is best for us to site our our new facility? So I would choose site B. This one, site one was 70 something, site two was 80 something, and this one was 80, 83. 82.05. 82. Point zero five, eighty two point zero five. Side yes, two, sir. side two. Eighty point eight. Eighty point eight. Side one. Seventy seven point five. So, which of the three sites are we going to select? Side three. Side three. Side three. Side three. Side three. Okay. So, if you are asked to recommend, you say on the basis of the weighted score. Side three, which achieved a, a total weighted score of 
is selected or is recommended. So are these answers correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Awache. Yes, sir. So please, uh, with, with exams purposes, if you are giving such a question, are you supposed to rewrite the, the, the factor, the, the initial scores before you write the weighted or you, you are supposed to go straight to the weighted score? Okay, so for the purposes of examination, I have just taught you that you bring a column by the side yeah, and then you say the weighted score, weighted score, weighted score. Now, if you just put the weighted score in, how would I know what you have multiplied? If you don't indicate the side score. Do you understand my, my point? Yes, sir. So you need to indicate the score for each of the location so that I can also do the multiplication and see whether the value you have put in under weighted score is correct. Okay, sir. So assume that I have the figures, assume that I don't have the figures. Now, in terms of reality, in terms of operations, even though this factor, this site, site three is the, the site with the highest score, some practical issues may come into play when we have to take that final decision, okay? And some of those factors could be uh, um, some kind of cost analysis, some kind of cost analysis. Here, we have done, we have done, we have only included the key factors which are important to us. And we look at, let's say we need, we need a facility. We need to either build our own premises or we rent it out. At the moment, our idea is for us to rent a facility out and then install our equipment in and then use it. Rent a building out and then we do, we set up our business in there. But maybe site three, it says that we couldn't find any suitable building which we can rent out. Yeah. And in addition, if we say we are going to build our own, put up our own building, that cost is too much for us now, we cannot accommodate. But there are, I mean, that kind of building in site two. So we can decide to choose site two over site one. Okay, these are the practical scenarios. Or maybe the type of building we are looking for to rent us to, to, to uh, that would be fit the factory. We are not getting it from site two, a site three. And again, we are not prepared to build the house ourselves. But those, that type of building can be, we can find many of them in site two. We can decide that even though this had came up as a second, will select the site because of this cost element. Erasmus, your hand was up. So, so uh, I have a question and it's on the assigning the weight to the location factors. You yeah. said that the weight is supposed to be between zero and one, but I wanted to find out if maybe there's a basis for assigning perhaps maybe 0 0.3 to labor pool and maybe 0 0.15 to wages. Like, is there a standard way of assigning uh, this Erasmus, way? Erasmus, are you married? No, please. You are not married? Yes, sir. OK. When do you intend to marry? <laughs> I don't know yet. <laughs> can we say next, next year. year or next year? Yes. Uh, I can't tell. <laughs> OK, great. Uh, are you currently dating? Yes, please. You are in relationship? Yes, please. 
with one person or with multiple? Oh, say one. <laughs> with one. Yes. Now, now, and your bear brave. You say you don't even have idea where you will marry, and you are you are there. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll bet you in Pratchett, pop, 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 pop. <laughs> Okay. But on a more serious note, um, Erasmus, let's assume that um, you, you are not seeing anybody at the moment and you want to get married. So you, you want to start searching. Okay. You have some characteristics among women that will influence your choice? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, just give us two. Uh, so uh, somebody oh, give, give me Give me three, give me three. Three. <laughs> <laughs> three is great too. Okay, so uh, I'll say somebody, an educated woman. Educated and, woman? Uh, yes. One. And, educated up to where? Up to where? Uh, GSS? No, 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 no. <laughs> tertiary level or something. Up to tertiary level. Okay, so yeah. that is one. Second point. And then uh, maybe a dark woman or something. A, a dark, dark woman. Com yes, complexion woman or something. Yeah. Ah, gift, gift, really? you are out. <laughs> so dark, dark woman. And then the, the next one. Tall, maybe tall or something. Yeah. Okay, yeah. educated, dark, and tall. Um, assuming that you are not getting all three from any of the three women you have supported, yeah? Okay. Which, which of them must you find? I, assuming you are to find only two pet, two pet, which of them must you find? Maybe I'll just go for uh, the education. And you, go, you go for the education and what, which one? Maybe uh, say tall or something. Yeah. Tall or something. Great. Assuming you cannot get the, the two, you can only get one out of the three that you mm. mentioned. Which one would you go for? Education. You go for education. So you see you have put you have put the weight on it yourself. Okay. okay. Uh -huh. So because education is so important to you, you say that okay, education, I am going to give it. Assuming you had only three factors. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You can say education, I'm going to give education, let's say 0 0.5, 5, 0. And then the next one, I can see you like tall women. So the height, you are giving height uh, 0.3. And then the other one is what? The skin color. Okay, yes. Skin color goes for 0.2. So that's how you assign the weight. Okay. Has the explanation been helpful? Yes, yes, please. So that uh, means that there is no standard. No, uh, no. I think season. I think I did say that it is done subjectively, depending on how they think these factors are important to them. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, but then what, whichever case it is, it must sum up to one. It, it the, the, the weight, the total weight must sum up to one. Okay. Must sum up to one. Okay, sure. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think in, in my last session on this one, somebody asked a similar question and uh, we mentioned, I asked the student to do what you have done. And this student, the factors that he mentioned, there was one particular factor that was so uh, interesting. He said, take lips, take lips. I said, hey. So I said, okay. So if I'm not getting all the factors and you can only get two, then he goes, my take list must come. Then he goes, I, I went again. If you're not getting all the factors and you can only get one, he goes, my take list must come. So sometimes take list, very important to some other people. Uh, Bismarck, your hand is up. Or is it Erasmus? Hey, Bismarck. Say please. Oh, uh, okay, the, Bismarck. When the things to consider after the weighted scores, this one, are you sleeping? No, sir. Yeah, you speak please. like man. Yes, sir. Say, please, apart from the cost, what again can we consider when we are choosing 
Cemetery school. So yeah, considering the sites or the location. You mean the other other influencing factor? I mean, if there are other factors which are important, you add them to the location factors. But apart from the location factors, then you should also look at um, we, you, we bring the cost components in, into play to, in making the final decision. Okay, so like we said here, site three has the highest factor rating compared with other locations. However, this evaluation will have to be used with other information, particularly cost. But apart from cost, which other factor can you also look at? I'm sure somebody will be Up thinking about demand. Demand, but for me, demand is also a location factor. And so if you think demand is very important, include demand in the, as, as one of the location factors here. Okay, yeah. So we are down with the location factor rating. Uh, class, please, any question on this? So, so uh, in terms of practicality, reality, how this will be done, your organization will set up a team and sometimes they can ask the operations manager to lead. Sometimes they can ask the general manager to lead, yeah, to lead the team. And then they will, they will ask the team to look for alternative sites. So you explore. Mm -hmm. You drive around town, you look at things you, are, you want, you look at facilities around us, okay. So we have identified four potential sites. But before you go out there to identify the potential sites, you need to clearly, as a team, you need to clearly sit down. You need to sit down and clearly define your location factors. What is important. And the selection of the location factors should be relative to the objectives of the firm. So you, you decide this and you drive around town to see which location. If it's not like uh, something you want to cite around the city and you may have to go to different cities. So you are considering getting into different cities. Then you have to visit the, 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 the cities in mind. Yeah. You can decide to go to Seiko Fordia, Adesu, Asasewa, uh, Tamale, Bulga, explore all of them. And those that you find suitable, you come and then weigh them on the basis of the factors which you have already identified. Then you do your summing and then you select. Center of gravity technique, the center of movement in a geographic area based on transport weights and distance. So this is a technique that identified a set of coordinates designating a central location on a map relative to all other locations. Central location on a map relative to all other locations. But the central location on a map relative to all other locations is based on the transport weights and distance. Objective here is to determine a central location for a new facility. And that facility can be a warehouse, it can be the factory, it can be anything. So what is the formula? Yeah. The formula is um, the X summation of X coordinates, summation of the product of X coordinates with the weight of shipments from that particular location and all divided by uh, the weight of shipments. Then you do so with the same, the Y coordinates. Remember each location on a map will have X coordinates and then it will have Y coordinates. Each location on a map will have X coordinates and Y coordinates. So we take the S coordinate and then we multiply the S coordinates for each location. 
we take the S coordinate multiplied by the weight of shipment from that location divided by the weight of shipment from that location. And then we do so for this, the Y coordinate. So Y coordinate multiplied by the weight of shipment divided by the weight of shipment from that location. Okay. So let's take a look here. In this example, in what the chart which is appearing on your screen now, how many, how many locations do we have? Um, so three. three stay. Yes, we have three. We have location one, which has X1, Y1. And those of you who have done geography before, this is how we write the coordinate, S comma Y, yeah? For a location on a map, S comma Y. So for location one, X1 comma Y1, and then you see the W1 being behind it, which is the weight of shipment from that, this particular location, this particular location. So the coordinate, the position of this on the map, this black spot here is X1, Y1. And usually when we are writing the, the coordinate for a position on the map, your X coordinate comes first before the Y coordinate. If we come to location two, it is X2, Y2, and then the weight of shipment. The same thing with three. Let's go here. Um, give to you, read this. Okay, so um, facility location models. The beggar doodle restaurant chain purchases ingredients from four different food suppliers. The company wants to construct a new central distribution center to process and package the ingredients before shipping them to their various restaurants. The suppliers transport ingredients items in 40 foot truck trailers, each with a capacity of 38,000 tons. The locations of the four suppliers, A, B, C, and D, and the annual number of trailer loads that will be transported to the distribution center are shown in the following figure. So we have um, the Y coordinates and then we have the X coordinates with the various locations plotted on them. Hello, sir. Hello, hello. Yes, sir. 50. Yes, sir, please, I'm done. Okay. So you are done, okay. Yes, so what we are saying is that this is the location for the four, uh, the suppliers transport ingredients in 40 foot truck trailers, each with a capacity of 38,000 pounds. The location of the four suppliers are A, B, C, D. These are the locations, A, B, C, D and the annual shipment of trailer loads. So the weight which is coming from each supplier, the amount of goods each supplier is shipping, that is the weight of shipment is here. So from C185, from B105, from A75, and then from, uh, from D60, okay? With the center of gravity technique, we are asking that, uh, what's the name? So I'm coming. The company wants to construct a new central distribution center, central distribution center. So they want to put up a new central distribution center where all the suppliers will ship hmm, their supplies to that center before the company will then ship it to its outlets. Before the, this manufacturer will ship it to its outlets. So where should we cite it? On the basis of the location of the individual suppliers, which position on this map will be central? On the surface of it, or looking at the map, if you don't take care, you say, oh, but if you look at this, if you look at that, if you look at this, you look at that, we, are, we can locate it here, where my Kesa is, if you can see. But you see, if you assume that you are going to be wrong, 
because we also need to take into consideration the weight of shipments from each location to determine the appropriate location. Because if you remember, we said we are looking at weight, we are looking at distance. So if you, if you cite it here as a lo lo location at the central location point, you said this is 75, this is 60, they get close. But look at this, look at this. They'll have to travel long distances. And the more you are transporting, the more costs you incur. So using the central, uh, the central gravity technique, we compute a location that will be central relative to the weight mm, of shipments. So let's go to the formula, write the formula down. Quickly write the formula down. Okay. Are you done? Almost. Six times four. Five times. Done. You are done. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Write the coordinates. Start from A. Write the coordinates for A and then and the, and the others. So A. A will be two hundred. S coordinate will be two hundred. Y coordinate will be two hundred. Y for the coordinates for B, they will be 100, 500. C will be 300, 600. So write it. When you are Are we done? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we're done. Okay. Now you have the formula there. You have the formula there. So the formula is here.
ਸਿੱਖਣ ਖਾਣਾ Okay, so you let's let's quickly look at let, let's make sure that the coordinates you wrote are correct. A, you have 200, 200. Did you get the same one? Is this correct? Yes. yes okay, yes, so yes, come yes, to uh, um, supply B. It's 100, 500, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think we got this one wrong. Let's see, 250, 600. Supply C. So 600, so it is. 300, 300. Uh, you had, we assume that it is uh, 300. 300, 300. Uh, but over here is 250, 250, 600. Okay, so change it, 250, 600. And then for supplier D is 500, 300. And this, the, the W, the weight of shipment from each location is written under it. Yeah, the weight of shipment for each location is written on it. So what we do is that we multiply, if we pick the face, the X, we'll do for the X and then we'll do for the Y coordinates. We pick the 200, multiply it by the weight, plus the next one, 100, we multiply it by the weight, so 100 by 105 plus, then we pick the next supplier, 250. We multiply it by the weight, 135, 135 plus 500. We multiply it by the weight, 500. We multiply it by the weight. Let me take that again. We said the S coordinate multiplied by the weight of shipment from that location. And then we sum all that up. So, S coordinates, 200 multiplied by weight from that location, 75 plus supplier B, 100, which is the S coordinate multiplied by the weight, which is 105, 105 plus supplier C, 250 S coordinates, 250 multiplied by the weight, which is 135 plus supplier D, 500 is the S coordinate multiplied by 60, which is the weight of shipment. And then when you finish, you divide that by summation, summation of all the loops, 75 plus 105 plus 135 plus 60, plus 60. That is what the formula says. Yeah? So if you do all that, you are going to get 238 for the X coordinate. Remember, we are looking for a position on the map that will be central to all the other four locations relative to the weight of shipment from individual suppliers. And for you to identify a position on the map, you need the X and Y coordinates. So we've determined our, our S coordinate for that position on the map to be 238. Then we do the same thing for Y. What is the Y coordinate here for supply A? 200. Then we multiply that by 75, the weight. So 200 by 75 plus, we go to supplier B, 500 multiplied by 105. 500 multiplied by 105. Then we go to supply C, 600 multiplied by 135. 600 multiplied by 135. Then we go to supplier D, uh, 300 multiplied by 60. 300 multiplied by 60. When we finish the summation of the load from individual suppliers, we sum it up and that gives us uh, 444, 444. So the X and Y coordinates for that new location is X equal to 238 and Y 244. Let's go to the graph. X equal to 238, maybe somewhere here. And then y equal to 444. 444 will be somewhere here. You see, 444 will be somewhere here. So roughly, this will be the location. 
for that central distribution center. Yeah, this will be the location. And you see that the technique has, because the technique took into consideration the weight of shipment from each individual supplier, you see that the central location is now closer to B and C because of the volumes of shipment from there. So 238, 444 will be somewhere around here. And that is a center of gravity technique. Center of gravity technique. You know what gravity oh. is, yeah? So the area with the with the, the heavy heavy resources being moved pulls mm, the gravity day is, is high, so pulls the the location closer to them. The gravity day is high, so pulls the location closer to them, and that's why you have it coming close to these two locations. But it's important for you to understand something here. So that's what we have here: x equal to two thirty eight y equal to 444. However, it should be kept in mind that these coordinates are based on straight line distances. And in real situation, and actual, in real situation, actual rules might follow more circuitous routes. So for example, we do this. We do this calculation and this s equal to 238 and y equal to, uh, y equal to uh, 444 happens to be in the C. Will you go and cite your, your facility in the sea? No, sir. No. You see, so again, you need to add common sense to it. Or you do it and it lands in, uh, what is the name? Uh, I can't even say. Uh, this forest. Oh, the forest that recently they put 700 excavators from, from there. What's the name of that forest? Etiwa yeah, Forest. <laughs> If you do your calculation as the, the selection team and the calculation places the location within a two hour forest, can you go and say that per hour calculation, it fell in the forest so, and Nananum give us the permission to clear the forest to locate our factory? No, sir. No, sir. So, that, that is, so you look at somewhere closer, look at somewhere closer. So it doesn't mean the exact location which you have been able to uh, uh, determine. That is in practical terms. That is in practical terms, okay? But if you were to be in exams, I am interested in these figures. I am interested in this, the X, X and Y coordinates for that new location. Class, up to this point, any, any question? Is it clear enough? Is it? Any question? No, sir. Sir, please, uh, with the uh, location, when you have the coordinates and the coordinate is not, in reality, it's nowhere or it's not at the point of maybe a feasible place, what do you do? That is what I just explained. You find a feasible location which is closer. Okay, sir. Uh, for example, um, when you did it, it fell within in a in a Accra, and in Accra, getting a plot of land, know the cost. Uh, in Accra, whereas. You don't have that amount of money to buy that 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 plot, so you can decide that okay, why why can't I go to somewhere near, uh, find somewhere around Kaswa to locate it, where maybe the land can be cheaper. And even in Accra, the kind of facility that you are locating, it may not even be permissible. Okay, thank you. So the third technique we are looking at today is the, uh, the load distance. The load distance. The load distance. And the load distance is based on the load being transported as well as the distance. And it's uh, not based on a single set of location coordinates, but several, several coordinates. 
Here again, we select the location with the least low distance. We select the location with the least low distance. So this is the formula, yeah? This is the formula. In fact, you can write this down. Write this down and also write this down. So LD sub J is equal to the low distance value for proposed site J. Uh, w sub IJ is equal to weight shift from facility I to propose site J. And G sub IJ is equal to distance between facility I and then the proposed site. So usually we'll have to calculate the distance first. And then when we are done, we come and calculate the actual low distance, the actual low distance. So the distances between the existing facility, in fact, this facility, I, I call it the existing facility. And then J will be the proposed facility size. Yeah proposed facility. And to do that calculation is equal to the root of xy, xi minus xj. So the existing facility coordinate x minus the proposed facility coordinate x, all squared plus uh, the y co coordinates of the existing facility minus the y coordinates of the proposed facility, all squared, right? So for you not to, for you to, I mean, something to guide you in remembering, always look at the I as the existing facility and the J as the proposed, the new one. Okay, let's go. Gifty, are you there? My Gifty. Yes, please, I'm here. Let's go. All right, so um, Vega Studio wants to evaluate three different sites it has identified for its new distribution center relative to the four suppliers identified in the example S7.2. The coordinates of the three sites under consideration are as follows. So site one, um, X1 is equal to 360. Please, am I correct with how I'm saying it? Yes, you are correct. All right, so um, Y1 is equal to 180. Then side two, X2 is 420. Y2 is 450. Then side three is X3 equal to 250. Y3 is 400. And um, the solution is first the distance between the proposed Okay, so don't read, don't read okay. the distribution. Okay, don't all read right. This sure. one. Don't, sure. don't read the solution, sorry. Yes, please. You see, this one is, is, is it's a long process, but we still have to teach you. So what you have to do in this case is that, how many existing sites do we have? Three. How many existing sites do we have? Three. Three. Existing sites? Three. Three of them. Three. Why three? Four. Those of you who said three, why three? So depending on what she read. Eh? It stated site one, site two, and site three. Oh, then you what? didn't read. You didn't what read, you didn't reading. understand the question. It says the beggar to do wants to evaluate three different sites it has identified for its new distribution center relative to the four suppliers identified in seven four. So the existing sites we have are the four suppliers. Those are the existing, the I, that is the I. Okay, please say. Okay, so we have four existing suppliers and now the company has identified three sites. 
Sometimes in an exam, we can give you up to five sides and we ask you to calculate. What makes this so elongated is the fact that you will have to find the distance from each of the four suppliers to each of the proposed sites. So that's the, this is the solution. So first, the distance between the proposed sites, one, two, and three, these are the proposed sites. So this is where we are considering to place our facility. Proposed site one, two, and three, and each existing facility, which is A, B, C, D. So we'll find the distance between A and site one. We'll find the distance between B and site one. We'll find the distance between C and site one. We'll find the distance between D and site one. When we are done with site two, we find the distance between A and site two. We find the distance between B and site two. The distance between C and D and site two. When we are done, then we come to three. So assuming we have 10 sites here, you have to do them, all of them one by one. So how do we find the distance? So site one and supplier A. Existing facility A. Remember, what is the coordinate? You wrote them down. What is the coordinate for supplier A? What's the X and Y coordinates? So they are 200 each. 200 each. So let's go. So between uh, site one and um, existing supplier A is equal to the square root of XA. You can make it X. I minus XJ, the same thing. So XA minus X1 squared. And our XA is the existing facility. The first X is your existing facility. And then the, the next X is your, the proposed site. So for our supplier A, our S coordinate there is 200 minus the S coordinate of site one. S coordinate for site one is 360. So minus 360 squared plus the Y coordinate of supplier A. Y coordinate for supplier A is 200 minus the Y coordinate for site one. Y coordinate for site one is 180. So minus 180 all squared. And that will give you the distance of 161.2. So we found the distance between site one and Supplier A. What next are we going to do? Site one and which one? Supplier B. Supplier, supplier B. B. So do, do for supplier B and let's see. What is the S and Y coordinate for supplier B? You wrote them down quickly. 100 and 500. 500. 100 X coordinates, eh? 100 comma 500. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Great. Okay. So put them into this and do them quickly and let's see. Is four one two point three. Four one two point three. Did anybody get the same thing? Four one two point three. Let's do it for site one and supplier C. Site one and supplier C. You have the X and Y coordinate there for supplier C. So let's do it quickly. Oh, 
Four two four. Point two six. Point two six. Yes, Your internet is not stable. I didn't get a figure. Four three four point two. Four. No, that's it's it's the x is three hundred. So you get four two four point two six. I think we did the correction is 250. We corrected it. We corrected it from 300 to 250. Okay. 434.2. Okay. Now do it for do it for site one and supplier D. Do it for site one and supplier D. One eight four dot four. One eight four dot four. Yes, sir. Okay, it's good. I I allow you people to try your hands on these things. I mean, what those of I know some of you are not trying at all. You are just watching us, but if you practice along with us, it helps. Mm? Mm. So for supplier one, one uh, site one and supplier A is 161.2. Let's go to the second one. Site one and supplier B is 412, which is three. For supplier C is 434.2. For supplier D, as 184.3. You have now calculated the distance between the existing facilities and proposed site one. Now what you have done, you are now going to do the same thing for site two. So you, you pick site two and supplier one, and you do the, the same set of calculations for all the four existing suppliers. Mm -hmm. You follow the same principle as we've gone through. And then when you are done, you go through, you go to site three and also look at the distance between site three and the, um, the existing facilities and the existing facilities. So in the end, what you have for site two, in terms of the distances are 333, 323.9, 3, 3, 226.7, and 170. If you go to site three, it's 206.2, 180.3, 200, and 269.3. These are the distances which have been calculated for the, the proposed site, the three proposed sites, and the uh, four existing facilities. So next, we look at the load distance. And the low distance, we do it side by side in terms of the new, the new proposed site. Remember our proposed sites are three. So we'll do the low distance for site one. We'll do the low distance for site two. We'll do the low distance for site three. And the rule says that we go with, we select the location with the least load distance. If you can see my cursor, we select the location with the least load distance. So let's move back. How do we calculate the low distance for site one? Yeah? So the load from A, which is supply A is 175. 175. 175 multiplied by the distance, which we calculated. To be 161.2 plus 105, 105 multiplied by the 105 is the load for which which of the facilities? B. 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 So 105 by 412. Yeah. This 412 here. This four one two here. 
And then if we go to the next supplies, 135. Supplier C, the load there is 135, multiplied by the distance, which we have calculated to be 134, plus supplier D. Supplier D, the load there is 60, multiplied by the distance, which we have calculated to be 184.4. So in total, it will give us 125,063. Then we we'll go to side two. Side two. Remember, these are the figures. So for supplier A, the load there is 75 multiplied by the distance, which is 333. For supplier B, the load there is 105, just like this one, 105 multiplied by the distance, which has been calculated as 323.9. And this supplier C, 135 times the distance, load times distance. Load. And that will give us a total of 99,070. 99,789. We do the same for side three. We do the same for side three, and we have 77,555. So, which of them is the least? Side three. Side three. Side three. Now, in terms of exams, this is one of the questions that we, we often ask because it has a lot of load. And students, for some reason, don't like this. But it's, it's so easy to do. Once you follow the steps. Of time. Sorry? The time, the time given. I know, it takes, it takes a lot of time, but if, if you understand, it's so easy to do. So, 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 so easy to do. So consider trying to do, I don't know whether it will repeat and um, bring something like this in the exams anyway. Okay, class up to this point, any question? Give to you any question? No, sir. Leonie, any question? Theophilus, any question? So please, for exam purposes, are we supposed to calculate? No, sir. Are we supposed to calculate the site one differently, site two differently, then site three differently? Since yes, we need, we need you to show all the calculations. Just like you've done here, We've done for the site one and the four existing suppliers. You show, you show the same calculation for site two and site three. So, Is your so question what the same? Formulas. I don't know. No, ask for the formulas. Don't, don't bother your head chewing them, but know them. Know that this is the formula for this. In exams, we'll give you every single formula you need to do the work. It will be at the back yeah. of the exam paper. Uh, but sometimes the formula is there and students don't know that this is the formula. So be, be familiar with the formula and say that this one, this is the formula we need. But you don't have to chew it into your head. Be familiar so that when you meet it anywhere, you know that this is the formula I can apply. Yeah, All the formula will be given to you. Is your question answered? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Now we'll move on to facility layout. What do we mean by facility layout? It is the arrangement of machines, department, workstations, storage areas, house. Some people call, pronounce this ISOs. ISOs. The correct pronunciation is ISOs. ISOs. So storage areas, aisles, and common areas within an existing or proposed facility. Now, normally when we are doing this kind of arrangement of machines, arrangement of departments, workstations, and storage areas, uh, we, we will do so to achieve some objectives. And the basic objectives of layout decisions are to ensure that there is a smooth flow of work, 
there is a smooth flow of materials and there is a smooth flow of people, a smooth flow of information all through the system. The emphasis is on the smooth flow. Layout decisions also affect quality and competitiveness. Can anybody tell me how a layout can affect quality of operations and competitiveness of the operation? Can anybody tell me? I'm waiting on. So can you put the question again? I said, we are saying, okay, two hands are up. Let me mention them. Nanaya, I do a Yes, sir. Good morning. Good afternoon, sir. Please. Good um, morning. Oh, okay. Please, Um, if we have proper layout, it um, improve the flow of activities, materials, improve movement of uh, workers. And because of that, it's up in the quality of a product. And also, it will, if there's a free flow of uh, quality uh, employees, materials, and information, it will help to achieve a competitive advantage in the sense that if it's with our customers and we have a good uh, facility that will help us uh, produce good products, we'll be able to act with our competitors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who else wants to add something to it? Francis data. Sir, please, when you have a good layout, many times um, when you are the organization, you're able to get the materials as a, a, a shortest possible time for your customers. So when the customers get it at the correct or proper time to do, do you like to patronize your service because you'll be able to be given the service as to when they need to be. You have it at the shortest possible time in the sense that sometimes when you don't have a good layout, sometimes you put the materials at a particular point, then even looking for them becomes difficult. And sometimes you delay customer and customers, as you know, don't want the delayers. And when this happens, it will bring a disadvantage, it will be disadvantage to the organization. So a good layout will help. Okay. Okay. Atiamo, Adam. Uh, please. It facilitates a smooth flow of a production cycle or, or activity. And in this sense, it reduces a uh, time. It, it, uh, it reduces waste, waste of time and enhances efficiency and waste of materials too. Thank you. Yes, yes, you are correct. So let's say our company, uh, production management company, University of Ghana, Production management company, that's the name of our company, interesting name. And we are we are housing a four, four story facility here in East Legon. And we said, oh, okay, we want to cut down cost. So the whole company, we are using a single printer. And that single printer has been placed on the top floor. So if you're on the first floor or ground floor and you want a document printed, you issue the command and you have to go all the way to the top floor, swipe your company card, and then the, your printout comes out of the, the printer. Look at the time it will take people to go and pick documents. Somebody like Gifty has been on leave, on maternity leave for three months, and she had just come. Atiamo has issued a command. He is going to pick it on the on the second floor. Atiamo Miss Gifty, who has been away for three months. Oh, hello, sister. How are you? Oh, we thank God for your life. Oh, so did you get a boy? Uh, did you get a, a female or a man? Hmm, I got a man. Oh, I see. So how how is he doing? What is the name? 
Have you done the naming already? That conversation can take about 30 minutes. <laughs> and why? And that, that is absolute waste of time. What has contributed to that waste of time is simply the layout. Do you agree with me? Yes, bro. Simply the layout. Malaya, you want to say something? Good morning, Nara. Uh, how was your weekend? Uh, Theophilus, we are in class. You're also chopping love on the phone. How was whose weekend? Get out. Sorry, dear. Ah, we are in class and you are chopping love on me. Let me let me copy money behind you. Sir, please, it's my bank app. Sir, sorry. Ah. Okay. Now we in the young call. So, effective layouts. What do they do? What benefit do we get from effectively? laying out a facility. We're able to minimize movement and material handling costs. We are able to utilize space and labor effectively. We are able to eliminate bottlenecks. Yeah? You know what a bottleneck is? No, please, sir. Bureaucracy. Oh. But you've seen a bottle before? Yes, please. What kind of bottle have you seen before? Beer bottle. Beer bottle. So bottle, I've seen all the types. I've seen the plastic bottle, the glass bottle. <laughs> this boy, this man is a bottle explorer. He knows all the bottle types. God be with you. Anyway, now we all know that with bottle, you see the neck. The, the, the size of the neck is different from the base of the bottle. So if the neck were to have the same size as the base of the bottle, just like we have with the shape of a cup, when you have something in the bottle and you are pouring, there will be no constraints. There will be no constraint. As soon as you turn the bottle, everything will flow out. But with the bottle, the neck is smaller compared to the base of the bottle. So when you have the bottle full of a liquid and you are pouring it out, the items, the, the, the liquid in the bottle cannot flow as it should because the neck is constraining the flow. And that is the concept which I've borrowed into, into, into management. So in areas where we have constraining factors, we call them bottlenecks, bottlenecks. I hope I've been able to explain it well to your understanding. Yes. yes so, um, Prof, is it the same as bureaucracy? Bottleneck? Yes, please. It will I'm not, asking it, if it is similar to bureaucracy. Okay, it may be similar to bureaucracy because you have to follow certain steps and those steps are required, uh, bureaucratic steps, and those create, uh, slows down the process. So let me give you a simple example, uh, like my usual head versus salon. Yeah, uh, this head versus salon has three stages. Stage one, you go, your hair is washed. Stage two, she puts you under the dryer your hair is dried and then you go to stage three where the hair is tall. Now this hairdresser is so poor that she's using an old rickety dryer. The dryer uh, takes about two hours to dry a single hair. So when this customer has, uh, sorry, this uh, hair, the, you're from Usenkra. Hairdresser. If this hairdresser has so many customers to attend to in a day, you see that the, the second stage, the drying stage will become a bottleneck in the process. I hope it's clear. Yes, bro. Yes, sir. It, will con it will constrain the flow of the resources through the system. 
you see? And we are saying that when the layout is effectively done, we tend to eliminate some of these bottlenecks. We are also able to reduce the manufacturing cycle time and customer service time, which is very important. We are able to eliminate waste and redundant movement. So eliminate waste and redundant movement, climbing the stairs all the way to the fourth floor to pick uh, a printout. So much wasted effort. We are able to eliminate that. We are also able to incorporate security and safety measures. Uh, recently, I went to an office and, ah, uh, you open the door, there are wires crossing the door. That alone is, 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 a, is a major hazard. And I don't know why up to, I won't mention the company's name, up to now nobody is, is doing anything about it. I, I stopped and watched it closely and the guy I was going to look at me, Doc, why? I worried about this. We, we are used to, it's been here for ages, so we don't care anymore. Look at this. But I told him that one day you will care. A good layout should, yeah, incorporate security and safety measures, promote product and service security, encourage proper maintenance activities and increase capacity for the firm. Increase capacity for the firm. Okay. So three basic types of product production layouts. Three basic types of production layout. The first one is a process of functional layout. The second one is a product layout. Please note, product layout is not the same as process. Yo, process of functional layout, product layout, and fixed position layout. So let's pick them one after the other. What is a process of functional layout? Uh, this is a layout where group, we group similar activities together in departments or work centers according to the process of function they perform. We group similar activities together in departments or work centers according to the work, according to the process of function they perform. Um, do you think this layout applies to the way we arrange our homes? Yes, please. Yes, sir. So knife, cooking utensils, fire. Are these items used on a, a common, uh, are they commonly used together? Yes. Yes. And so where would we find this? In the kitchen. In the kitchen. Towel, sponge, soap. Uh, toothpaste. Um, toothpaste. Should I say toiletries? Where would you find these? In the washroom. In the washroom. Yeah, let me let me come in with a small joke here. I asked a similar question with the undergraduates and quite interesting, you know, some of these guys have come from a home where the, everything is in one room. <laughs> so I asked the question and the, what the person said, in the bedroom. And then the other students started laughing. <laughs> I said, okay, knife, cooking utensils, this, and then the same boy in the bedroom. Okay, toiletries. This, 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 in the bedroom. Um, what is the name? Television, sound system, ele electrical guy in the bedroom. And then the class was like this, hey. <laughs> it was very interesting, anyway. The point here is that in our homes, we tend to follow this functional layout. So items that perform similar functions, we tend to place them together. So the cooking utensils, the gas, the, the cooking stove, the microwave, all of them, they perform similar function. They have similar functionalities. So we put them together. 
or they do similar jobs. So we put them together. Toiletries and other things, they do similar job. We place them in a bathroom. Sound system, television and all that, they perform similar function. We put them in the living room, okay? So if we talk about the process or the functional layout, this is a um, kind of arrangement, operations arrangement where we group similar activities together in departments or work centers according to the process or function they perform. Characteristics of, <clears throat> And usually with, in, in terms of operations, we'll have, we'll experience intermittent operations. Oh, sorry, sorry. This, this is a characteristic, this layout is characteristic of intermittent operations or service shops or job shop or batch pro production. Because not every, every, mach every product would have to go through all the, all the machines within the environment. Yeah, when a machine enters the facility, the machine, sorry, when a job enters the facility, the job will be routed to the area where machines that can perform the work needed are kept. I don't know if I'm confusing you. If I'm confusing you, let me bring in an example. So for example, if you are pregnant and you are rushed to the, I mean, you are due and you are taken to the hospital. Will you go to the eye center? No, bro. No, sir. Will you go to the emergency ward? Maternity ward. You go to the maternity ward. You see, that is where the machines, the people, the resources that are needed to work on you as a pregnant woman, that's where they are. So that's where you go to. And you don't have to go through the eye center to go through the emergency ward before you go to, um, what is the name? Uh, the maternity ward. You go straight to the maternity ward, okay? And usually with functional layouts, equipment is general purpose and the workers mm -hmm. are skilled at operating the equipment in their particular department, particular department. Examples of these are supermarkets, where we have women's clothing session, men's clothing session, children's clothing session, cosmetics session, and the rest. Another example is machine shops, where we have these. Now, a process layout or a functional layout would have the following advantages. Flexibility. Yeah. If I walk into Melcom, Melcom is a supermarket and it will have this process, um, this functional layout. If I walk into Melcom, I don't have to go through all the aisles to locate what I'm looking for. I, all I need to do is to know the, the, the family of products where the item I want to buy is. Uh, so for example, if I want to buy, um, If I want to buy powdered soap, where will I go to? Which section in the supermarket will I go to? Uh -huh. Sanitary section. <laughs> you go to a, a sanitary section, pa. <laughs> Toiletries. <laughs> you go to wear pastries. Toiletries. Toiletries. Okay. You see, some of it, this tells me that when you go to the supermarket, you don't you don't raise your head to look at the sections they have created. Every hour will have an indication of what is there. So from today when you go, watch. You are doing operations management. So when you go, watch. Which section am I? Raise up your head. You see it's there, clearly written, boldly written there. So I don't have to waste my time going through the men's clothing section, da, 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 da before I, I simply can ask somebody, um, where can I find, locate this item? And they will should tell me, oh, go to the detergent section and you can find this item there. I just walk straight there and pick the item and go back. So that flexibility is there. And usually with, Manufacturers that apply the 
uh, our processing facilities that apply the functional layout, they tend to have low finished goods inventory because they tend to work with customer order. They tend to work with customer order. They don't normally produce to stock. Okay. Process layouts have potential disadvantages of being inefficient. Why? Because jobs or customers do not flow through the system in an orderly manner. When somebody is going to the maternity ward, another person is going to the emergency ward. When somebody is going to the emergency ward, another person is going to going for surgery. Uh, when somebody is going to the OPD, another person is going to do. So that haphazard movement. There is no smooth flow of people and resources through the system. There can also be backtracking. You go here and then you come back to this one, then you go back again, that sort of thing. Movement of movement from departed to departed can take considerable amount of time and queues tends to develop. Lastly, live service page may be required for in-process inventory sometimes. The next one is a product layout. We have the process of functional layout. We have dealt with that. The next type of layout is the product layout where activities are arranged in a line, in line according to the sequence of operations for a particular product or service. Has anybody been to Casa Preco before? Yes, nobody. Or special eyes, special eyes. Nobody, I see. Okay. When we are done with this, uh, please, Google... I've been to farm milk before. Okay. Do they apply the product this the product layout? type do they apply this does farmwork apply this type of layout the product layout okay the answer is yes most manufacturing companies would apply this for those of you who have not had a chance to visit any manufacturing company you can just Google Toyota's uh, production facility in say South Africa. And I say Google, use uh, YouTube and you see the production facility and how the cars are manufactured. It's a product layout. Mm -hmm. And this layout can be a long, a straight line, a long straight line where uh, you have various workstations. So the item, the car will move from one stage to the other. When it gets to your point, whatever it is that you need to put on the car, at one point, they'll have to put the engine into the car. At one point, they have to fix the doors on the car, uh, fix all the outer coverings on the car. At another point, they'll have to fix the interiors into the car. At next stage, they'll have to spray the car and, and that kind of process. So that is the product layout. Uh, activities are arranged in line according to the sequence of operations. One stage, the bottles will be cleaned. They have a special term for it. Then at another stage, the bottles will be filled with whatever content it, that has to go into the bottle. Shame on to all of you. You think I'm going to mention alcohol. It can be Adonko. <laughs> it can be Adonko hand sanitizer. And then another stage, the bottles will be sealed. Another stage, the, the labels will be placed on the bottle. Another stage, the bottles will be packed into boxes and that comes to the end where the boxes are packed. So, and that, that kind of line can be U-shape, it can be uh, L-shape, it can even be circle, but it follows the sequence follows that sequence. It may be a straight line, it may be an L, L shape, it may be a circle, it may be U shape. 
but it still qualifies as a product layout as long as the product is moving through um, sequence of events to get it done. Usually with product layout, we tend to have high level of automation mm -hmm. and production or the service being delivered is, is usually a standardized one. So if you are producing a bottled water, 0.5 liter bottled water, are standardized across. So the machine knows that this is standardized. This is the bottle which is moving along and it works with it. Highly automated. Advantages. It's highly efficient. It's very easy to use. And you may, it may also tend to have small storage space required, needed. Disadvantages, inflexibility, significant changes in product design may require new assembly line and new equipment. So for example, if people are saying that the, the Adonko one, two, three bottle is too small for them, and people like dry bones, the leader of Ghana Drunkers Association, he's called dry, Moses Dry Bones or something. If his group says that the bottle is too small and that we, they need to increase the bottle, the size of the bottle, I don't go may have to. Hey, which company produces that? Look at the bottle. So that's which company produces I don't go be this? Angel, angel, something. Samia, nobody knows. If you mention it, it doesn't make you a drunkard, though. Please. So I think it's the angel, and the angel group. Is the angel group, eh? Okay, okay. Okay, so, so when there is significant change in the product design, the whole, um, the whole production line may also have to be changed. This happened some time ago within the US auto industry. But at the time, this is why we always say that when you are building a facility, incorporate some element of flexibility in the facility. The auto manufacturers had designed their production at this layout that, that accommodates particular type of uh, cars. And then demand for cars moved from salon cars to SUV. So the auto manufacturers who, which had designs specifically put up for uh, salon cars were handicapped. And at the time, Honda, Honda, yeah, Japan Honda, had a layout which could accommodate both salon cars and SUVs. So they made a lot of money at, at the time because they didn't have to change their, their, their facilities, their equipment. It was the same thing, and they just had to swap, you see. But what we are saying here is that for the product layouts, that inflexibility could be a disadvantage of it. Okay? And it may also require warehouse for finished goods. It may also require warehouse for finished goods. The major concern here is balancing the assembly line. So avoiding workstations becoming bottlenecks. What we mean here is that, you know, when it's a product uh, layout, you tend to have workstations that the products will travel through. Now, if these workstations are not well balanced, you will tend to have a workstation having so much to do with other workstations having virtually nothing to do. And so in operations, there is this concept where we will look at later on, where we tend to make sure that the workload at each workstation is relatively equal for everybody. And that's what we refer to as balancing the assembly line so that we don't have work loaded at one workstation and then the other workstations doing very little. When you do that, it creates bottlenecks, that which I have just explained a while ago, I did explain to you, creates bottlenecks. 
Then the fixed position layout. The fixed position layout. Here the item, because it is so heavy, uh, the item is placed in a fixed position. It, the item may be bulky. It may also be fragile because if you move it, move it around, you make it, the item product may get damaged. Or it is so bulky or heavy to be moved around. So we place the item in one location and the resources that uh, attend to the item, this may be equipment and people, they do the traveling, they do the traveling, they do the traveling. Hmm? Some of you, some of you, you apply, <laughs> you apply this fixed fix position layout, layout on your, on your, a, because they are too heavy to be moved around. So it, it becomes, you sing the song for me, yeah, okay. Anyway, examples are houses, ships, aircraft. What about roads? The three types of layout that we have discussed this morning, which of them do you think will apply to road construction? Fixed uh, position layout. Fixed position layouts. Because we cannot go and bring the road between Koforodua and Kukurantumi. We cannot bring that road to uh, Accra Highways Authority, their office in Accra, and say that we'll construct the road there and then go and put it there. No. So we, this is fixed position layout. Once a while in the objective, in the multiple choice questions which we ask you, uh, we we'll bring some of these things. Okay. So these are the characteristics. Um, I want somebody to explain this one to me. Highly skilled workforce who perform specialist jobs. Can anybody explain this to me? Um, so this one, I think, what, what do you think of a construction company? Uh, bro. Prof is needed. Hello, hello, Claire. Sorry, um, I was mis mistakenly muted. I ask you to try and see if we can explain this one to me. Yes, bro. Um, bro, let me try. Uh, in the case of neurosurgeons, or uh, when a special surgery is needed, and the machines or the skills that are needed are not at the place. They have to fly people to a special place which is fixed. Or uh, when surgery is needed, you have fixed surgery room. 
where surgery will be operated for you. Mm. Okay, so normally you will need people who have the skills required to do the job. It's a, normally a specialized kind of work and you need the skilled people to do the work, okay? So I was thinking of construction companies, those that do the roads, the um, layovers and all that. Yeah, yeah, that can also fit in there. That can also fit in there. Okay. Designing process layouts. One objective is to minimize movement of material costs. Departments with closer, with the most interdepartmental movement should be located closest to each other. Yeah, and the two techniques which we normally apply to design the process layout are one, block diagramming, and two, relationship diagramming. Block diagramming and relationship diagramming. Let's look at the block diagramming. What is it? We get data on historical or predicted movements of material between departments in existing or proposed facility in the form of from to chart or load, what we call the load summary chart. And then we calculate the back and forth movement, which we uh, refer to as the composite movement between each pair of departments and rank them from, from most to least. Then we assign each department to a block on a grid so that non-adjusting, I'll explain what we mean by non-adjusting. That is distance further than the next block loads are minimized. Ideally, the optimal layout, please, the emphasis is on ideally. The optimal layout has zero non-adjusted loads. We add information like equipment vendor safety regulations and all that to whatever we are able to produce, okay? So let's take a look here. These are the departments. Department one, department two, department three, department four, department five. When there is a direct movement between two departments, we call that adjacent movement. So between one and two, there is adjacent movement. Between two and four, there is adjacent movement. Between four and five, there is adjacent movement. When you have to cross one department before you go to the next, like this one, this one is what we refer to as non-adjacent movement. This is non-adjacent. And non-adjacent movement is usually represented by broken lines. Adjacent movement is represented by heavy lines. You see? Between three and four, there is a movement of 40 load. And that is also referred to as non-adjacent movement. Okay, now let's go back. We want to work out. Gifty, are you there? Yes, please. Yes, I'm here. Okay. So please read this for me. Okay. So, Baco, is it incorporation? Okay. So yes, Baco incorporated. Okay. Uh, Baco incorporated makes back scalpers. Processing equipment that strips the back of trees and turns it into nuggets or mounts for gardens. The facility that makes back scalpers is a small job shop that employs 50 workers and is arranged into five departments. One, bar stock cutting. Two, sheet metal. Three, machining. Four, painting. And five, assembly. The average number of loads transported between the five departments per month is given in the accompanying load summary. Summary chart. The current this, layout. Hold on, hold on. This is the okay. su load summary chart. Okay. Right. Carry on. Okay. So the current layout of the facility is shown schematically on the two, three grid. Notice this one. that. Okay. Okay, go on. All right. So notice that there's quite a bit of flexibility in the facility as indicated by the six possible locations, that is intersections, available for five departments. 
In addition, the forklift used in the facility is very flexible, allowing horizontal, vertical, and diagonal movement of material. And please, should I continue below? Yes, please, here. Yeah. Okay, so Baco management anticipates that a new back scalper plant will soon be necessary and would like to know if a similar layout should be used. No office. Or if no a better need. or if a better layout can be designed. You are asked to evaluate the current layout in terms of non-adjacent loads and if needed. And please, can you kindly scroll down a bit for me? Uh, okay. And if needed, propose a new layout on the two by three grid. That will minimize the number of non-adjacent loads. Remember, I have told you that when we are doing the block diagramming, our objective is to try and reduce the non-adjacent load. Why, why do you think the focus is on reducing non-adjacent load? This is non-adjacent. Why do you think we want to reduce this? To save time. It saves time. So we want to rearrange this so that the, the, the departments that have that bigger uh, movement, inter-departmental inter -department, inter movement, we want to put them close. So we avoid this unnecessary walking. Yeah? It saves time. It says time. So the question says, look at the current, the current uh, um, layout. Look at the uh, load summary chart and see whether you can rearrange this to make it better. Okay. Now to start, what we we'll do is uh, you look at one and one. What is the load there? Gosh. And then you put, you write one. So, but one and one, there is, I mean, it's the same department. So there is not going to be any load. So normally one and one and if two and two and three and three. That's why you can see dash, 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 dash. So you don't include them in your load sum, uh, this thing. When you are preparing the load, ranking the loads. So first we start on that piece of paper by your side, check, Write one, put a double directional arrow in the middle and bring two. So you write one, provide, draw an arrow with arrowhead at both ends. Yeah? And then another one here like this. So one to two, which means between one and two. Let's look at what is the load. One and two is 100. So you write 100 plus, let's look at two and one. Two and one, there is nothing here. So plus zero. So between one and two, the load there is going to be 100. Then you go to the next line. We write one and three. So one, then you put the arrow, the double directional arrow uh, between one and three as the next. So one and three, what do we have there? 50. Then you come and look at three and one. So it's going to be 50 plus three and what is there? 60. So 50 plus 60, which will give you 110. Then you go to the next one and four. One and four, what do we have there? Nothing. So you can write zero yeah. uh, plus four and one. Four and one, what do we have there? We have zero. Yeah. So zero plus zero is equal to zero. Then we come to one and five. One and five, nothing there. So zero plus five and one, which is also zero. So you write zero there. We are done with that. We are going, we are now picking two. But remember that we have done two and one already. So you don't do two and one. And two and two doesn't exist because it's the same department. So we start from three. So we write two, we place a double directional arrow and we place, we bring three. So two and three, we have 200. What about three and two? Three and two, 
nothing there, so zero. So 300 plus zero, sorry, 200 plus zero is 200. So it's equal to 200. Then we come to two and four. Two and four, we have 50. What about four and two? Four and two, what do we have? Nothing. Correct? 100. So it will be 50 plus zero, which will be 50. Now we come to two and five. Two and five is zero. Two and five is zero. And then let's pick five and two. Ali Kem, Tete, your hand is up. Ali Kem, Tete, your hand is up. Ali Kem, please unmute yourself and talk. Hello? Ali Kem. Sir. Yes, what's Sir. your question? Sir, the four and two from the table is 100, but you are saying zero. Ah, okay, okay. We were doing two and four. So two and four, okay. Two and four uh, is, 50. is 50. 50 plus four and two. Four, two which is 100. 100. 100. So 50 plus 100 is equal to 150. Correct. Thank you for that correction. I'm sorry. Now we'll go to two and five. Two and five is zero. What about five and two? Five and two is 50. So zero plus 50 will give you 50, okay? Then we pick three. Of course, we have done three and one already. We have done three and two already. Uh, we can have three and three. So we start from three and four. So three and four is 40. So 40 plus, Four and three. Four and three is zero. So 40 plus zero is 40. Then we go to three and five. Three and five is 50 plus five and three. Five and three here is zero. So 50 plus zero, which will give us 50. When we are done, we go to four. We have done four and one already. We have done four and two already. Uh, we have done four and three already. We can have four and four. So we do four and five. Four and five is 60 plus five and four, which is zero. So 60 plus zero is 60. When you are done, we pick five. We've done five and one already. Five and two already, five and three already, five and four already. We can have five and five, so we are done. Now, all that you have written, I rearrange them in, in terms of the size of the load. Rearrange them. Which one becomes the highest? One, two, three, eight, eight, two, two, four. four. So rearrange them. So if if it's uh, the bigger, the one with the highest sum is say two hundred. Uh, you say one and one, uh, that would be one in what? It's, it's two and what? Two, two and four. Eight. It's two and four. Two. Yes, two that eight. will give you 150. Is 150 the highest? Yes, sir. No. No, no two and three. No, no. Two and three. Yeah, yeah, 200. Yeah, yeah, 200. Yeah, yeah. Two and three. Two and three. Yeah. Two and three, yeah, two and three. Right? You see that there's some, the summation you have done, run the summation yes, and when you finish, Rank them. So if 200 is the highest, write one. The next one, 150, okay. write two. The next 100, write three. So that you come and rearrange it. OK, sir. Mm -hmm. Are we done? So because of time, let me move on. So this is what the composite movement, this is what you are going to have. Yeah, two and three, 
check with what you have, whether this is correct. Two and three will give us 200, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Two and four will give us 150, correct? Yes, sir. One and three will give us 110, correct? All right. Yes, sir. Okay, and the rest in that order. If it's the same value, 50, 50, it doesn't matter which one comes first. No, three and five can come or two and five can come first. Okay. The load is the same. So don't worry, don't bother your head about which one comes first in terms yes. of the ranking. Then you do the, your ranking as we have done here, okay? Next, we evaluate the goodness of the layout by scoring it in terms of the non-adjacent movements. So this that we have calculated, the composite movement that we have calculated, we need to draw this diagram. We need to draw this diagram, yeah? And then we'll put the composite movement in between them. So between one and two, what is the load? Between two and three, what is the load? Between four and five, what is the load? Between one and four, what is the load? And that is what we do here. Remember you are putting the composite load. This is the composite load. So between one and two, let's see one and two. One and two is 100, that's why you have 100 there. And remember I have told you that for adjacent direct movement, we call them adjacent movement. You make your lines heavier, okay? Now between one and three, one and three is 110 here. And because we are traveling over one department before we go to the other, we call this non-adjacent movement. These are adjacent, closer, adjacent, non-adjacent movement. You are crossing one department before you go to the next. And we represent non-adjacent movement by broken lines, broken lines. So once you have done all this, the next thing is for you to say, okay, now there is a space here on the grid. Can we do rearrangement such that we can take away this non-adjacent movement, movement here and this non-adjacent movement here? Remember the objective in block diagramming mm, is to have the optimal position where non-adjacent will be zero. But sometimes we may not get zero. So let's see, see if you can swap the departments around and try and minimize the non-adjacent movement. Can anybody propose the first one? On the horizontal one, two, three, in the vertical dash four, five. Okay, so you are proposing that we have one, two, and three as it is here. Yes, sir. And then we take four from here. Do we bring the four here? Yes, please. I will bring the five here. Yes. Okay, class, let's evaluate his proposal and see whether it will work. Let's see whether it will work. If we maintain one, two, three, and then we bring four here, and then we push the five to this corner. If we bring the five to this corner, and we bring the four here, there will be this non-adjacent movement will then become three and four. So that non-adjacent movement will go. And this movement between three and five will be here. So it will be resolved. But what about, the movement between two and four. Well, if four comes here, there'll still be adjacent movement. So no problem. So we have taken care of this. Now, what about our 110? So my good friend, your proposal will resolve one of the non-adjacent movements, but we still have the 110 load, non-adjacent movement still being there. So you have not solved the problem. Any other proposal? Bismarck, a watch. Yeah, yes, bro. Yeah. Let's go. Bismarck, Atemo, your hand is up too. We'll shift the four 
to uh, below three, we shift the four below three, and then shift the three in place of four. Ah, you are saying that we should bring the four here. If we bring the four to this yeah, yes, below three. empty position, yeah. and now we bring the three here. To in place of four, yes. In place of four. Yes, please. Okay. So if we bring the three in place of four, that means there will be direct adjacent movement between one and four, and that will take care of this non-adjacent movement. What about the movement between three and four? Uh, three and four. If you say we should bring three here, I will put four here. We we'll still have a non-adjacent movement between yeah. three and four or forty. Okay. okay. So your proposal doesn't solve the problem. The women, where are they? So, so another proposal. Yes, another proposal. So on the horizontal one, two, four. And then on the horizontal one, two, four. Two, four. And you come down dash three. Dash three. Five. Three, five. Okay, so let's see, class, let's see if it, it will work. One, two, and four. And then we leave this place vacant. Then we, we put three and three five. And five. Three and five. Uh, if we have three here, and five here. Okay, okay, let's look at the first one. One, two, and four. So if we bring four here, in order to solve the non adjacent, the one and three. The I'm one. coming, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, wait, wait, I'm coming. If we bring four here, uh, non adjacent movement between one and three. Okay, the three will be here. So that non-adjacent movement of 110 will go away. So the 110 is solved with this diagonal movement. What, and then you are also saying that, so we bring three here, four here, and then five here. What about four and three? If three is here and four is here, that also solve this 110, um, 110 non-adjacent movement. The yes, the 40. Okay. What about this 60? If we move four here and five here, there will be adjacent movement. So I think that proposal solves it. That's good. But there could be another alternative that will also solve it. Okay. Yeah, I so wanted to say that we should, I wanted to say we should bring the one to the top of two and then shift five to be under three and see. Okay, okay, but let's take his, his, propo his, his proposal. He says one, two, four, and then three, five. That arrangement can take away, mi minimize the non-adjacent movement to uh, zero. The focus is the non-adjacent movement. In an exam, we can ask you to show us the composite load, yeah? Calculate the composite load between departments. So that will be this one. In an exam, we can tell, we can ask you to tell us the total non-adjacent load. So if you have four non-adjacent, maybe we could also have um, uh, uh, another one. Let's see. Okay. So. Can you can you identify any non-adjacent movement here? So what Apart about from, one? What about one, two, and you have three, four, five beneath? Because what about hot? Sorry. Like you have one, two, then down you have three, four, five. Is it still going to be okay? It's also going to be okay. I've not worked that one out, but we can check. I want to see the, the po possible non-adjacent movement apart from one and three and three and four. Which other movement can, if we had on this diagram, would represent another non-adjacent movement? 
Can you point anything to me? None, sir. Four and three. Four and three. None, sir. It's all, all, it's, it's all Four and three is already there. Four and three. So it's none. None. Yes, sir. Apart from these two. Okay. Thank you. So like I'm saying, in an exams, we cannot ask you to calculate the total non-adjacent load. And so if you if you calculate your composite, you put them in the diagram, you show us your non-adjacent load, then you can calculate the total for us. Two hands up. Nanea, your hand is up. Please, okay. it was the old one. It was the old one. So let's look at the solution. Yes. I hope you didn't look into your lecture notes. My good friend who proposed this. Yes, sir. Did you look before telling us? No, sir. sir. I worked it uh, the other time. So you do that. Oh, okay. 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 Then we have sir, relationship. Sir, please, I, have, I have a question. Go ahead. Sir, please, I'll soon uh, finish. Okay. Sir, please. Uh, when you when you started, you are saying that we can have zero at the end or a figure at the end. So what? We can what have we, what? We can have what? We are changing the non adjacent to. We are making the system. Your voice is it's like you are in an office, so you can't speak louder. No, sir, Raise it a language. little for us. So language, we can hear. Please, uh, you are saying that. It's not always the case that we get zero at the end. So what if we have a figure at the end? What are we supposed to do? OK, I think I, I heard you. Sometimes you can do the swapping of the departments around, and you still have some non-adjacent movement. But the idea is that if you should have non-adjacent movement at all, it should be the, the barest minimum the barest minimum. So for example, we have this, let's say in this typical example, uh, we do the swapping of the departments around, yeah? And no matter how we swap it, we can only solve one, adjust, one non-adjacent movement. We should try and look at the one that will be the barest minimum non-adjacent movement. Yes, yes. Is your question answered? Yes, yes. That would be the 40. That would be the 40. Is your question answered? Please, thank you. Okay, all right. So related to the block diagramming is what we call the relationship diagramming. And here, the relationship diagram is a schematic diagram that uses weighted lines to denote location preferences. Again, here, it is also subjective, depending on what the manager wants, what operations director wants, what general manager wants. Block diagramming is appropriate when quantitative data is available, yeah? Like this, we have the quantitative data. So we are using block diagramming. But when quantitative data is not available, we use the relationship diagramming. We use the relationship diagramming. The relationship diagram uses the manager's preferences. It is called Moodle's grid. It is called Moodle's grid because the person who invented this was called something, something Moodle. Look for his first name and tell me. Quick, 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 check for his first name and tell me. Has anybody found it? Richard. Okay, so Richard Muda. Thank you. So these are the letters we use, A-E-I-O-U, X, just like the, the vowels, A-E-I-O-U. That's what my English teacher taught me, how to remember the vowels in the English alphabet. It says, you say A-I-O-U, then you can remember all of them. So A-E-I-O-U, the vowels. Okay. So we represent absolutely necessary with A. 
especially important with ye, important with I, okay with O, unimportant with you, undesirable with X. So the manager will, will indicate what their preferences are in terms of locating two departments together. So if he thinks that uh, production and uh, the stock room should be close, he will indicate that the, the relationship should be A, absolutely necessary. Let's have a look. So this is what following the discussion with the, uh, the, the, the manager, like here we are acting as consultants to help the organization put their, their departments, I may have a good layout of their departments. So we had a discussion with them and these are the preferences that came out. Uh, the manager says that between production and offices, it is all which is what? Okay, between production and stockroom. So this is stockroom, it goes here and production, this is where they meet. So the manager said that between production and stockroom, the relationship is absolutely necessary, which means that those two departments must be close, okay? And then between shipping, sorry, between the locker room, and offices, locker room and offices. It is X. X means what? Undesirable. Undesirable. You see, normally those of you who are working, which people use the uh, use the locker room? Administrative staff. Do they also use the locker room? Sometimes. I think you don't know. You see, normally we use a locker room for production staff. You know, in most organizations, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, the attire you wear to work is not the attire you have to wear on the production floor. You go in there, they are all wearing white, 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 white. So when you go in, first you go to the locker room and then you change. You take off what you brought from home and put them in your locker and then you lock it. And then you pick your shop floor attire and then you put it on. Um, then you go to the shop floor to go and work. You see? So offices and locker room, uh, offices and locker room, X, because office staff don't use the locker room. So we said X, undesirable. So rearrange the, the layout such that there will be no movement between those two departments. So this is these are the preferences. And based on the preferences, you are to improve the location. This is the current location of the company. And in relationship diagramming, we represent A with five strands of lines. We represent G with four strands of lines, with I with three strands of lines, zero with two strands of lines, J with one strand of line, and X with a zigzag line, X with a zigzag line. Please take notes. So when you have this and you are asked to redo the layout, the idea is that we want to reduce these longer and bigger strands of lines. We want to reduce them to make them shorter. The shorter, the better. The shorter these heavy lines, the better, okay? So, Based on this metrics that we have developed with consensus from staff of the company, the operations manager or the general manager of the company, we look at the current layout and we improve it to this. See? So between production and stockroom, is it absolutely necessary? So uh, production and stockroom have to come close. And so in our improved layout, look at this is stockroom, this is production. Originally, this is production, this is stockroom. Some kind of non-adjacent movement is there. So we want to shorten this, make it shorter. And that's what we have done here, okay? 
If we had time, I would have asked you for you to also look at this and propose a new, a new look, uh, uh, see if we can make this better. Like this one, hmm? this is not the only solution. There's another solution to this work. So in your own free time, try and swap the departments around, apart from what you have in the lecture notes as your solution. Try and swap it around. You arrive at another solution. So there are two solutions. Bismarck, your hand is up. So please, uh, with the arrangement, you can start with one, or you can start with two and one in the middle. OK. I, I want to leave that to the class. I, I, I don't want to tell them. They should go and solve it themselves. Okay, so we could give you something like this. First, let's look at the practicality of it. In terms of the, in practical terms, you will come in as a consultant, say that, okay, uh, the company will say, this is the issue we have. We want to see how best we can locate our, our, our departments closer in terms of the movement that we have and what we think. Then you will develop the models grid with them. As a consultant, you don't develop this model's grid yourself. You ask them to tell you, so what do you want? Between this and this, what do you want? Should it be close? Da, da, and then they will tell you, and you will put this thing in. So when you are done, then you use what the metrics that you have developed together with them into this, into this. The idea is that you want to shorten the, the bigger strands of lines. You want to reduce them and make them shorter. The shorter, the better. The shorter the better. Okay. And again, we use the relationship diagramming when we don't have quantitative data. If you have quantitative data, instead of relationship diagramming, you rather do, you rather do block diagramming. Block diagramming. Okay. So uh, these days there are computerized solutions. You can key in the data into a computer software. And a typical example is Craft or Corilla, and it will put up the design for you. Other than struggling with what we are doing here, the computer systems are there to help you do the location layout, okay? Uh, I will end here and we'll continue next week. Uh, Gifty, write this number down, 234. Write it down. Next week we'll continue yes, from please. here. Yes, sir. Okay. And tell the class, those who have not been coming for lectures, that I'm taking attendance. Let me just go to the chat room and take it straight up. Yes, yeah. Yo, where is my chat? Sorry, participants. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Right. Have a nice day, sir.